Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Lasters of Europe. I'm your host, and welcome to the right now, time for the hunt with Reichskommissar Miller. Reichskommissar Shank looks at his uniform in the mirror. He wonders if it still has that glow the airmen at his base commented on all those years back ago when they were still fighting the Russians, and the days seem full of hope and glory. The shine of the past forms an obscure ache in his throat. He swallows gingerly. An aide comes to shake him out of his reverie, gesturing to his briefcase and papers, and the Reichskommissar of Sudwest Africa grabs his things and leaves the credit room in Vinhook he has been quartered in. He's running through the itinerary sent maybe about eight hours ago or so from the base in the Congo Miller is quartered in, hoping against hope it doesn't tally with any of the native resistance groups he's taking note of for reasons when the gunships arrive. It's a pride of the local helicopter fleet, gleaming and black-edged like a phantom, and also a pack to the guilds with weaponry, not all of it necessarily in line with the weapon standards Germania sets down. Does one helicopter really need a mobile bazooka turret suitable for an AA battery? But for us, we do. He gets on board with a hurried word to the pilot, and he's on his way to whatever bizarre adventure the hunter of the Congo, as some would have taken to calling him in private, has in mind for them. One can only hope that it won't turn out like the <clears throat> hunt in 1958. The unnamed villagers still haunt Shank in his dreams. I'm not sure whether to be worried or excited. And let's see. Ooh, we have some military factories. What are we missing here, really? Uh, it's been a while since... I, maybe not a while, but it's been like 24 hours since I played... Or maybe about 28 hours since I played the last episode, so... Man, we're actually doing... Okay. I mean, we need tanks. But other than that, we're looking pretty good. Because we will need a few more tanks, especially once the war starts. Uh, we had two more millies? Wow. And of course, we're trying to make some more planes here. Just so we can like, make some more money, because Germany... They don't really like us that much. They're extremely displeased, and that's okay. We've got some comms to go through as well. Uh, actually, let's close out this one too. Cool. All right, we have $22 million, which means we're going to spend a lot of people here. Uh, Resource-wise, oh my gosh, we need so much, so much. Aluminum, rubber, tungsten, steel, and chromium. All the stuff that we need. Um, let's let town go on slowly, and let's go and buy uh, a spot of aluminum, shall we? We shall. Why not? And my apologies about that, my cat wanted to leave the room, but one comment, it was, um, someone was said, like, actually a couple people said, that, you, well, I put uh, Wolfgang Schenk on the thumbnail, oh, look at this, this Chilean self is a flame, but with Wolfgang Schenk on the thumbnail, some people thought that that was actually Alex the Rambler, <sighs> Alex Rambler, is, is he a flying ace? I don't know, maybe not, but, he has commented in one of my videos before, and I wish he'd comment again, let me play that mod again. I don't know, I watch Alex Rambler occasionally, but here's some gorillas. The mountains grew from the skyline to the foreground to the background to backdrop in a scene which would no doubt be thrilling if experienced in a movie theater back in the Reich. Schenk readies his personal weapon, a rifle drawn from the armscot of Windhoek. He's never been one to keep aff affectations like service rifles without necessity, primarily because he's afraid that, on one of his worst nights, he might use it in a fit of pique and prepares to shoot. Mueller shares I'm grinning that today's target is simple. Gorillas roam this part of the Plateau Mountain jungle in packs, and the traces are fairly visible from the air. All they have to do is follow the trail and the hunt will be theirs. Then Shank is shoved through the open rear doors of the copter to keep watch for these gorillas. Sure, soon. He spots what he's looking for. A distinctive trail of crushed branches, tangled vines, imprints on the fourth floor heading east. The helicopter swings around and flies over the trail headed east. A pack of small figures come into view, and the copter flies so low over the ground that Shank nearly falls over through the turbulence. Thinking about issuing a formal complaint to Germani about this negligence, he points his rifle, aims, and shoots. One figure flies back and the rest disperse. Shank and Mueller take immense joy in chasing them down and hunting the pack. Some escape, but many corpses are thrown to the jungle to rot. It seems the hunt has been successful so far. And despite his best inclination, Shank is excited about it all. Wow! I hope Mueller gets his prize of the gorilla's head. Or just the body. I can still feel, but let's wait for that. Radio transmission from Bakuvu Militar Basis. As the helicopters swing in the lazy ox towards the hunting zone, garble transmissions come through onto the airwaves, trouble, uh, hostile activity, village of uh, attack, your permission? Mueller puts on the headset and begins barking orders. Shank hides his amusement. Despite Mueller's complete disinterest in governing, he has a formidable capacity for working on the ground. Perhaps he would have done well as a hair officer. Mueller glances at the map pinned on the helicopter's side and gestures to a region of the mountains with a cluster of red pins. Rebel activity, perhaps. Miller puts down the headset yelling, We're getting reports of partisan activity near this area, old chap. Listen, 
I don't want to hit the brakes on a little endeavor, but it looks like this cluster of hostiles might be close to us, and it's not like we're going to use all these shiny new guns on a bunch of rhinos. He looks so giddily excited, it's hard to imagine that he's talking about partisan elimination, not hunting. Shank closes his eyes and tries to ignore the thoughts about going through his head. Memories of swooping fires, spitting guns, raining heck fire down in little dots that screamed and cried and fell in blood heaps against the black soil and lay still. He shakes himself to consciousness. Miller's still there, still waiting for his affirmation. Shank can, hardly, can barely bring himself to nub. The helicopter arcs across the green green brown plains and towards a cluster of huts on the horizon where cooking fires stirring up smoke across the vast skies like the spindly handwriting of children. Oh dear. It's time to get a little excited here. Sart Th Thunderot appointed Prime Minister Talent. Have I seen that one before? We dream of our own talent. Huh, I think I'm pretty sure I've seen that one before, but that's interesting. Excited, huh? Cool. Here are the rebels. The long approach from the mountain is hard. Steep winds from the high ground hit the helicopter hard. And through the juddering, Shank can barely hear what Mueller is saying to him. Something about that time he nearly blew up a giraffe by pressing the wrong button. Shank has heard too many stories about along these lines from Mueller to count, and it seems this one is no different from the others. He focuses his attention on the village below, clustering with people and campfires, but gunfire crackles ominously to the edge of the tree line. Are these people insurgents or just native protection squads? It's, it's kind of difficult to tell, especially when the helicopter. They drop to a low altitude and start sweeping the village or encampment occasionally. A gunshot rings out as some poor fool with a stolen weapon fires upwards in an attempt to chase the threat away. Mueller yells that they'll have to move in even closer to dispose of the rebels, and Shank steals himself. He's no longer the stage where the sound of loud noises leaves him a shivering wreck in the morning. Hopefully, he'll not return this time. The copter, or helicopter, heaves up dust and stray leaves as it swings towards the ground, and Mueller authorizes the use of extraordinary force. He whips out his custom rifle, gives it a preemptive check, he yells to open the door of the helicopter, it leans down and begins shooting. The occasional cry on the ground of reloading are the only sounds Mueller makes as he aims and fires. Shank feels something drop at the bottom of his stomach, perhaps it's just a soul. Or perhaps he just never had one. I'm sorry, I just, I saw a plane right here, I'm sorry, is this? That's not Shank doing this right now, but that actually looks really cool. Then, the hunter yells to him, Come, don't just stand there. Join me and clean this place up. And Shank is dragged to his feet before he can utter a single word of protest. Gun in hand, he follows through the motions. Aim, shoot, aim, shoot, aim for that one reaching for his rifle. The one barely older than a boy. And shoot. Oh, goodbye. Hey, they made it back to base. That's actually really cool. I never noticed this before. Maybe I have. An episode. Down and down and down and down the helicopter descends down to the black green depths. Shank gazes calmly at the shrouded figure, dripping blood and viscera, onto the half-painted floor of the copter and that has just taken the Reichskommissar Mueller's position. The figure opens its mouth and out of its mouth come the words, Whoa, you feeling okay, Shank? Want to lie down for a bit? I know fresh hunting hunting fresh game can be tiring. <laughs> it appears the show shock is back again. Spiraling blades, spinning winds, the world turns on a dance of endless fire and blood and as Mueller shoots, the thing he is shooting morph into little boys and girls in Russian villages. As he swoops in on wings of cold metal and hot lead, the figure bursts, pop, 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 like fleshy, little fleshy firecrackers and fall apart little broken porcelain dolls like Muti used to give at Christmas. How raspberryish! How long has it been since he has tasted raspberries? But not like that, surely. Is there blood on his hands, or is he just, a, is it just the wrath of his country on his back? Is there a difference? He barely hears the panic shouts. What are you doing, Shank? I like the trees too, but the insurgents have all gone. Took me to fill up another ammo uh, request form, darn you. Violently, the world comes back into focus, and Rex Komosa Shank sticks his head out of the helicopter and wretches. He can barely bring himself to stagger and stag stand and stagger back to his seat. Oh, that was a bad episode. Whew. And also, we're currently doing Bounty of Africa still. I um, mean, if you want to read that again, please go ahead. But back to base. Siegfried Miller gazes at the shaking wreck where once lay a Rex Commissar. Shank's eyes are dilated and his hands are trembling. Miller wonders if he's suffering from the same type of glazed eyes shock that old Heinrich uses morphine to cope with. It was never quite the same after the incidents with the elf elephant and the patrol squad. Either way, Mueller can tell when a man is beaten and Shank is sure as heck beaten. Perhaps a hunt should be called off. <clears throat> he asks again if Shank wants to continue with the trip. Below him, the ruined village... Uh, a ruin, yeah, the ruined village sprawls bloat and thick with fumes. It appears that they have hit a few of the fuel tanks on the approach, and some of the figures running from the scene are luminescent, ha haloed with gasoline flame. Shank gazes at the scene and says nothing. His hands, however, reveal what his gaping mouth cannot. <clears throat> Miller shakes his head and calls for the chopper to head back to base. Maybe another time, friend. Shame you couldn't be a stronger hunter. A corner of his mind thinks that the problem lies with their medical care. Perhaps the partisans have poisoned the medical supply? Certainly the Reich has decreed that only best bed rest is necessary for recovery from shell shock, and why would Germania give false instructions to his jungle garrisons? This is over, and we have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm. So, uh, after this focus, what are we going to do? Work harder, not smarter. We can't afford to improve our technologies yet, which means we'll have to rely on good old tried and true methods to extract more resources. The natives might get angry at us for long working shifts and corvée drafts, but we're working for them too, so surely they'll forgive us when all is said and done. With that said, we can now concentrate on improving our quotas. Self-sufficiency is a day's watchword. Nice. The next couple of stars is back! Ah! He's back, everyone! 
But like Skuma saw, Shank staggers out of the helicopter as the vent hook spirals in his eyes. He can barely make out the aides coming to assist him, and he's far too gone to care. The show shock has eaten away at him over the years, making him weaker even as he strove to avoid it. But at least his aides know what to do. A steady drip of morphine and a few hours of bed rest, and he'll be up at least until the next time. As he lies there in the, in the ward, he looks back on his experience. Did Miller always know about his condition and try to trigger it deliberately? He doesn't think so, but it's always been hard to tell with Miller. In his mind, people fall down endlessly like pins hit by an ant ball. At the touch of bullets, whistling as they travel down the length of the long and undulating gun. Perhaps that Freud fellow had the right idea about the unconscious. Shrink isn't sure whether these dreams are coming from, where they're coming from, but he wants them repressed and sent back to the dark corners of the mine. Either way, one thing is certain. Shrink is never going hunting with Mueller ever again. The hunter can find another companion for his next hunt. As for him, he has work to do, and villagers to often uh, do business with. Well, at least he's safe now. And we, this is got 3.48 million to Germany, huh? It is July 5th, so this year is going to be great. It's going to be a great year. I'm sure nothing bad will happen this year, so... Hmm, eh, just in case, there you go. Back to the runways. Sorry, that was my cup of coffee here. I sat on the table. How much do we have? We have, eh, we have a good amount. Not as much as I want to do to sell some fuel. I'd rather do stuff down here, so. The Bounty of Africa. Ikeda, elected Prime Minister, good job. Uh, just in case, right now, I'm going to put you on the border. I'm hoping that when the war actually does start, that our allies will come to our, uh, I don't say rescue, but to our help, so they can help cover the border, so we can just concentrate our forces here, so. That is at least my hope. Now, we can train these guys. These guys are not terrible. Not too bad. Could be better, though, of course. Could be much better. Cool. Actually, uh, sell some fuel. Sell lots of fuel. We are training, so I don't want to sell stuff yet. Sell gold and diamonds. Germany would be pleased. Okay. I mean, they're already pissed off at us by an extreme amount. You know what? Screw it. Let's not do this first. No, 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 no. I want to exit. There you go. Just because. I want to get this one more of these done. All right, so 16. We have nine. That's not bad. I'm not going to lie. That's pretty good. Pretty nice. And it does cost us money, but whatever. Cool. Nine jumps up to seven. Or jump down to seven. Okay, that's not good. <laughs> very, oh, very high. Okay, so that's good to know. Extremely. Is there anything above the extreme? No, that's alright. Um, it's alright. They get some more fuel. I don't know if they... they even if they can use it. But Western methods. Our extraction facilities are outdated in both expertise and machinery. By importing new equipment from the mainland and retraining our personnel, we can increase our raw material extraction rates and in turn further reduce our reliance on imports. Germania is so far away from Vindhoek and with it the Reich supply lines. In the event of war, these tethers die first before all others. We must learn to rely on ourselves now, lest we limit our full efforts later. Okay, some more money, nice. And some more rubber and steel. That's not the love. Hmm. I don't know. I don't really want to use it up too much. Oh, good. Rubber processing is good. Nice. Greatly displeased. I mean, can it get any worse than very high displeasure? 15% is extreme. Um, slightly displeased. We get more fuel this way. We get a little bit more fuel. I'll give us more fuel. Why not? See what we can do with that. And we got to keep making sure our land auction is A-OK, -okay, my friends. There you go. Very nice. It is 63 Anything for guns, actually? Yeah, 62. Yeah, let's go with that one. How is this looking? Eh, uh, military spending's okay. What's the methods, my friends? 6,200, not bad. Uh, sell lots of fuel we could. How much money do we have? 3.68 million. Uh, it keeps going up. So that's not good. I mean, eh. Once Germany falls apart, does it really matter? But the Africa mat miracle. Until a few years ago, Sudwest Africa was only a joint airstrip for the Afrikaner Luftwaffe. But ever since our resource extraction and factory productivity rates have appreci appreciably increased, investors now flock to Vidhook to strap their markets to the interest rates our rising futures return. With our reforms and efforts, we have secured a city income source, legal or otherwise, and increased our industrial capa capabilities far beyond what we'd hoped for. Already the Reich has called us Africa's unforeseen miracle. All we need to do now is ensure that no one ever discovers what we have done with the money we now make. Nice. Make a giant investment in our Rexco Monserrat. We'll be greatly pleased. That's good. We get more oil, and we get some more steel. Hey, we're positive on rubber. I wish we make more political power, though. Oh, whoops. Um, yeah, point one four is not very good. That's very, very bad. And having only seven savings to work with kind of sucks big time, too. But, you know, it is what it is. Are things improving here at all? You know, the military might be. Oh, power tools all. Equipment, yeah. It'll be worse. 
Greetings come in small packages. The great Benguela Iron Mining Complex had changed a lot since ever since the first trucks delivered those strange machines. The Germans called them Druckluftheimer. To the natives, their name seemed like a ma magical chant, for its mere presence banished into memory the days when they had to break their bones against ore veins with nothing but a pickaxe. One Druckluftheimer compares the hardest stone in seconds combined with the newfangled electric carts, and not one spine has snapped delivering iron ore to the surface since. The mines directly complained at first, more so in order to train the natives in matter is better left to Aryans and increase their wages when I all deserved was a whipping to remind them of their place in Aryan society. His t tune changed when he read the reports so the director's eyes almost popped out of their skull when he landed on a quarter figure with what cl was clearly a misprint of extra zeros. His complaints left as fast as they appeared after the majority shareholder telephoned him to shut his trap and let the money flow. The natives of Benguela largely ignored such great gains, but they felt their effects. Death rates had dropped to single digits, and the workers' wages had grown large enough to afford canned goods, bicycles, and even store-bought medicines. The streets of Benguela, just as the others in Angola and Namibia, slowly filled with people doing their business just as their minds filled with the noises made by jackhammers, trucks, and trains. Good change has finally come to the city this time, as people hopes for good. A new age for Africa. Uh, so now we want to please Germany. Um, slightly please. I mean... This stuff slightly pleases them. How much money do we have? 21 million. That's good enough. Uh, slightly displeased. Slightly displeased. Well, I mean, we want more fuel. I guess we're done training for now, which is fine. Uh, greatly displeased. Slightly displeased. Slightly, slightly, slightly. Slightly displeased them, and then slightly please, please them up. Please them up. And that sounds weird. Uh, they'll be pleased by this. I don't know. Maybe we should try that once. Is this still up very high? It's still very high. Uh, you know what? Give us a few more days then. It's fine. We can afford it. There you go. Let's try this one. So they're pleased. It's still a very high displeasure, but whatever. Um, followed up with a one-man sky. We possess the largest concentration of combat airplanes outside the mainland, so the burden of protecting Africa's skies from the high map foes falls to us. This, of course, implies constantly updating air fleet's engagement tactics and strategic doctrines. To this end, we should permanently establish a research and development committee for studying breakthrough innovations in modern air warfare. The brilliant stratagems we'll dev they devise will greatly aid us in fulfilling the work that Germany asks of us. Great. Right, so sell the diamonds and gold. Very, very nice. Very, very, very nice. They're extremely displeased, but, you know, what else is new? Oh, we just send $5 million. Jesus Christ, that's so much. Oh, don't, that's fine, whatever. And at least hopefully they'll like us a little bit more. We get $10 more million, which might be nice, but still. One man's guy. Alright, so now, they're still very highly displeased of us. Oh, that's not good. We really pissed them off. Sell some fuel. Oh, we could. We probably honestly need to. So, go and sell a lot of fuel. It's fine. The Africa Miracle. Letters from Germania are usually bearers of bad news, especially when they are covered in seals and stamps. For once, the letter Wolfgang Schenk is reading Buck's common sense. The Ministry for Colonial Affairs is officially co co commending him. Simply put, for having turned Sudan's Africa from a godforsaken sterile land only good for serving as a giant airship to an actually developed Reichskommissariat. The missive especially cites links from several important industrial firms who have invested in Angola and Namibia. All who are eager to see further developments. The letter's closing words, however, made him reflect. We at the Ministry eagerly wait for more good news. Trust assured that the Reichskommissar will enjoy the attention has been guiltily denied over the last few years. Heil Hitler. The Ministry for Colonial Affairs. Uh, its tone worried him. Was the news truly good? What did what 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 was it that he did for the genuine best? Or did he overdo things? Now that Super Africa was developed and prosperous, it received more funds, yes, but also more garrisons and stricter inspections. Now he wasn't so sure of his plan. What if they'd actually doomed everything by being so oh, overzealous? Shank shook his head. Things may be more difficult from now on, but this doesn't mean he'll give up. There's so, so much to do, and he will er, fulfill his oath. If a man investing more time and resources, and even paying greater attention to his own actions, then so be it. Wow, that's a lot of pee-pee. Um, I don't know, maybe we could try to... Forty million dollars, that's really nice. I do want to lower the consumer goods here, so... Doing this will please them, and we can all use this stuff, so... Actually, how much steel do we have? We oh, we have a... P we need aluminum, we need tungsten. That's all we need right for now. Aluminum... We don't need rubber right now. We'll probably need more of it. You know what? Let's get another infrastructure. Civi, Millie, why not? And we're going to save some of our PP a little bit. $30 million. We don't have a lot here. Slightly displeased. I um, mean, we can still sell more fuel, so we're kind of going to be probably okay. 100000 is really nice. Oh, we've already maxed out that as well. 8 out of 20. That's not too... And Hitler's dead. Hmm. Okay. 30 basic jet fighters. How many do we have? Minus 42. Okay. Ew. Well, that's not good. Well, let's see how, how long we need to actually keep this stuff. Because if 
they just stop this stuff, then I'm just going to take whatever we can get. So, a unique graduation. Every month, another class of pilots completes their training in the Sudwest African Luftwaffe Flight School. Every month, a group much dwindled from their initial count romps out onto the parade square. And we have the Germans of War, of course. <clears throat> their customary wings. Oh. Gleaming on their dress uniforms' chest, this month's graduates, however, were a changing custom. Valdemar probably marches in step with the slight squadron as they swung their arms to the drumbeats, dressed sharply in their parade attire. The column of graduates moved past their commanding officer in the small crowd that had gathered to witness the monthly event. The uniforms were tailored the same, but the crowd's disbelieving stares toward Valdemar that he stuck out among the rest. Perhaps a black man marching in a Luftwaffe parade occurred less often than once a month. The parade came to a halt, and the commanding officer made his way along the lines of graduates. One by one, each right breast received the Silver Reichsadler. The Oberstleutnant paused when he arrived at, uh, paused, paused at Valdemar, hesitantly staring down his graduate before pinning the eagle upon his chest. In other days, Valdemar would have been bothered, perhaps even discouraged, to receive such peculiar attention today. Not one iota of his mind went towards the skeptics. He had endured training that most cannot. He had worked harder than many ever will. He had earned his wings, and now it was time to fly. A flight. A progress. Uh, I don't think no matter what happens, we can't do anything here, but build a bomb up. Fighters, transports. I want to do fighters. Fighters, my friends. They are the mainstay of any air force, and the Afrikaner Luftwaffe is no exception. Though we are mostly possessed bombers for raiding West, West Africa, our air fleet still keeps fighters to maintain air supremacy over Namibia and Angola and escort said bombers in their forays beyond our borders. Retaining our status as the rulers of Africa's skies entails producing a stockpile of fighters from replacing those which may be lost to either dogfights, anti aircraft fire, or accidents. Unfortunately, the SKL lacks the size and funds for exploring all eventualities. This limits our eventual expertise to only one aspect of fighter warfare. There's another comment. Actually, a lot of you guys said that I should play, uh, or liberate Angola, which is a kind of unique path for our country here. So we'll see. Um, no guarantees. I'll try my best, but I've heard it's quite difficult. Oh. I should have invested a little bit more before Germany fell apart. Yeah. Hey, well, Tenu, actually. Very, um, does this even matter now that we have very high German displeasure? Does it even matter? Like, honestly speaking, does it even really matter? Um... We all need more planes where we're headed. Standing by, yeah, you don't have enough. Um, you know what? We need as many planes as possible. There you go. Alright, out of 5,700. Uh, there you go, just in case. Keep as much fuel as you can right now. Actually, you know what? <sighs> we can spend one more. English Civil War begins. Everything's falling apart. I'm going to get a little bit more fuel first. Just because we'll get raided if we don't. Get this done first. I want to get as much fuel as possible because we're going to need it. Also, Africa proposes the Africa Shield. Shank. A sign from the speaker. <sighs> what do you want, Herr Hutig? A guarantee of sorts. How are those birds of yours? Completely operational, thank you. Then they'll serve us well in the coming days. What are you planning, Hutig? Hutig moved over the proper words for a moment. Total victory. Tying loose ends. Fulfilling our destiny. Whatever you call it. And send our men to the destined droves. Perhaps against the Americans too. That has been their oath-sworn duty and you know it. Rax Kamasa, Hutig ground out. Keeping his tone level against the buffoon and Vinhook was harder than he thought. Or will you let them waver when they needed the most? The imbecile took far too long to respond. Of course not. The Luftwaffe in Africa is at your behest. For country's sake, or courtesy's sake, Hutig summed approvingly. They'll see that they will. Good day. Click. A fine show of diplomacy, Hutig. Ah, I love allies. Hidden heroes. Alright, so what do, you, what do we do with the PP? Oh, we... Wow. We actually... I would love to cut military spending right now, just so we can get, get a deficit going, but... C'est la vie. Also, no, there was another comment saying that I should play Serbia in a thousand week right, play Janjik Serbia. Ah, I need to go back to the mod, especially the Balkans. The Balkans are funny. They're a very violent group sometimes. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. Uh-oh, South Africa looks like it's gonna go kaboom! And the Jews are doing well in, uh... Oh, there goes the Boer Republic. And Madagascar. Tree, please, tree, no. Oh, please, tree, please. No? Okay. What is Madagascar? Do they... Have... I've said this before, and I'll say it again. He's got a gigantic forehead like Ka Kaidai Mundi from, like, Star Wars. Be happy or else... Oh, man. I need... I'm going to play this again. Whenever Ost Africa gets content again, I've got to play as Hans Hutig. His haircut, I just... It just calls to me. Anyways, uh, the Boer Republic has no content, and I still need to play South Africa at the time it's recording, but I've been avoiding it just because I've heard it's difficult. Like, South... Oh! Well, here we go, guys. I don't know how long this campaign is going to last, but... Here we go. Um, strike fast. 
Or control the skies. I like controlling the skies. Controlling the skies is of the utmost importance for winning every war, or any war. For the dogfights, our fighters need not only speed, but also agility and armor. Our air supremacy. I love supremacy. Consequently, our ground forces total security from bomber attacks can be quickly gained through slaughtering the enemy's fighters and mass in such engagements. With this in mind, we should concentrate our efforts towards expanding and improving our conventional fighters. They shall secure our might over the skies within the both the Rex Commissariat and without. And we're about to boost up military spending very soon, too. Um, I guess at this point, it doesn't even matter using this stuff. I mean, yeah, eh, it does help us get more stuff. I mean, we really want to use these guys, really. These guys are better, but I don't know. Uh, using both makes it slightly cheaper to use. Just got to wait for the war to pop off, and we'll have a good time. And, all right, the shield goes to war. The call is coming out from Quillamane, Niederstossen. Most African divisions have begun to advance on the South African border, while fighters and bombers take off from the remote runways. The contingency plans that colonial officers have been drafting for years will finally be put into effort. While news of the invasion is yet to reach the general public, our press officers are currently preparing a statement to be read by the Reichs Commissar on all radio stations. In the meantime, the mobilization of anti-aircraft units and reserve garrisons around our major cities will surely attract attention. We must strike the South Africans quickly, and with overwhelming strength, the Africa Shield is going to war, and victory will be ours until probably some of the Americanos show up, because we do have a couple of these guys here too, so... Um... Ah, yes. The Etona question. Oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. So this is it. The Krieg und Sieg. Nice. Are we training? We're not. That's good. Um, we'll see what we can do. Let me see the game, just because I don't know if I'm going to go back to this. Uh, whenever, like, I know Africa's going to get updates someday, probably. But the eternal question. Let's read this first. It was never easy to sleep in the African heat, even with the winter approaching. Shank's eyes tracked the fa fan, lazily slackling in the dusky room as moonlight cast deep shadows from the window. The likes of Commissar thought of flashing under the stars, their lights unmawed by clouds, but he did not deserve clear skies, only shadows. All the better hide in a coward, a traitor with false heart, and no conviction. War in Germany. Crows fighting for the corpse of the Vaterland. War in Africa. A pointless struggle to maintain a pointless system. Filing colonies defended by a shield of SS fanatics and corrupt mercenaries, led by Rex Commissar Shank, the most despicable of them all. In the sky, he could lose himself, pretend to be a better man, helping the natives, giving them the means to overthrow the Germans. It was remarkably simple. Nobody audited it to West Africa, especially not in these times of civil war. A better man than Shank would have done this a long time ago. In the distance, the change of the gods. Good lads, here to avoid a life of drudgery in Germany. Men worried about, sick about news from the Vaterland. Soldiers who trusted in Rex Commissar to save them from the South Africans and Americans. Perhaps it was not too late for Shank to choose the easy path, treating his conscience for the man who, like him, served an empty master. A salve to make the pain easier to bear. A decision, grim certitude, as the Rex Commissar began drifting to sleep. No matter the cost, Shank knew where his heart would lead him in the morning. To, to attempt an attempt to save Angola, or try to defend Germany. Well, everyone, let's attempt to save... Angola. So now, push for better tomorrow. If you know Rax Kumsal Wolfgang Shanks' plight, his regret over having kind of gotten rid of a few thousand of Russian innocents, their faces plaguing his nightmares until he wakes screaming every night for the past decades. Fewer know that his desperation for atonement. Only a handful know his willingness to seek it. Here is a bitter truth. Rex Commissar Schenk's illicit activities have long traversed the tenuous line between disloyalty and treason. Far from Germania's eyes, Schenk cedes the ground for better Angola. The homeland he envisions bustles with native men, women, and children, all happy living and free from the shackles that have long chained them in pit mines, pits, and factories to their deaths. This is his dream, our dream, for we must all see forgiveness for sins in which we are complicit. He hopes his actions will ease the mountain of burdens on us all. Let us hope we share as it is one of a dwindling few, keeping many of away from the nuisance's sweet promises. We shall build a better tomorrow for godforsaken land. Perhaps in doing so, we may even save our godforsaken souls, but probably not. Ah, beautiful. Now, they don't attack us, which is fine. I do want to attack them, but where? Oh, how would you go in first? Where are, my, where are the fall boys? The fly boys? Can you guys actually go into there? Yeah. Man, if we could connect over here as fast as possible, that'd be extraordinarily good. Come on, get in, get in, get in. Oh, we got him! For now, for now, we're barely holding... Go and do as much damage as you can right now. If we can take out all these guys, I mean, I'm not going to say the world will be won, but that's very good. You find some guys, you beat them up. Not bad. Not bad so far. Oh, also for the war, boost it up. So this way we'll really win. Get some more output too. Go in there too, because they're probably moving there as fast as they possibly can. And come on, plans, please go, 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 go. Ah, see, I knew they were going to be attacking us. Are you slow or for any reason? Um. Ah. See, now they're eight combo. We want to take off these these guys. We need to take them off to make sure that we'll do okay. Garrisons, reinforcements are medium. 
Um, subject is our government's occupied territories. Local police force, we go there. And instead of that, we'll go with uh, eight companies and recon. Not exactly the same thing. So, I'm not sure why we would choose one over the other, but whatever. Um, but after a push for a better tomorrow, the audacity of hope, the secret war, the Yankee connection, making dreams reality, and never-ending work. History will be kind to us, but it's time to take our bow. South Africa will see this opportunity to break through German lines. Oh boy. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be helping push, but oh well, the secret war. Uh, were they already aware of our activities, then the high map would not be hesitant or hesitate to brand us as traitors in their eyes. Ours see differently. After all, who else has ordered acts only mankind's most heinous examples should ever entertain? Who else has smilingly engaged millions and decades of wanton, meaningless slaughter, clothing atrocities with, man, ma with many duties, polite fictions? Every metal pin to our chest for neutralizing insurrectionists and destroying rebel facilities as if murdering women and children is worthy is worth a shiny slag of metal, as one more dagger piercing our hearts, feeding into our pains, regrets, and despairs. We have met contact with someone just as eager as us in removing the traces, all traces of German dominance in Africa, the CIA. The so-called companies express interest in supporting our illicit endeavors. We shall soon meet their em emissaries clandestinely to cooperate or coordinate our next moves. Very soon, very, very soon. We will take great pleasure in wiping the Fuhrer's smile off his features. Very cool. Oh, again, buy more stuff, some more planes. Who takes not very suspicious of Mueller? As an, oh, be, both men are not suspicious at all. And if they become very suspicious, they will attempt to shut down our plan. We cannot let that happen. Lower suspicious and a little bit more. Airlift his men. Um, wow. You suck at That's really bad for oil gain. Lower it somewhat. Personally, lead a bombing run. That's kind of cool. End of resources. Uh, oh, that's sad. We should have got more. We really should have got more, but that's okay. Things happen. Please don't lose too much, guys. Because right now, we've got to grow, grow, grow like crazy. If you can, just hang out here. This is the most important area for now. Screw the rest of the line. That doesn't matter. This, this group is good. The kind captor. Despite his rigorous training and plentiful experience, no amount of com competence and calmness could have helped, helped men cast spot of safety against the cockpit's arms, blarings, or alarms, nor the indicators on his panels gone haywire. The aircraft continued to emit its gassy tones as the fields grew closer. Casper looked frantically for the flattest field he could find and spotted a flat field. The altimeter took down like a reverse stopwatch as Caspar pulled the noose, or noose, no, nose up and braced for landing. With a great thud, steel met soil and shrub. The impact was little more than a blur in the pilot's memory. The following hours or days, Caspar couldn't tell, were spent in a state of fever, streams, and faded consciousness. Sometime later, he came to. He woke in pitch black. Small uh, pinpricks of light speckled the room from above. It said Split with pain as he attempted to sit up, then his right leg burst into daggers of pain. Casper roared, forced back onto the cot by his agony. Voices stirred from the ceiling as if startled by Casper's cry. His ears picked words from a foreign, and vaguely familiar tongue. In an instant, a hatch creaked open and brought blinding light to the chamber. Eventually, the pilot's eyes adjusted to the intruding bright glare, first revealing a cellar's stone walls, then his torn, bloody flight suit, with the pant leg fast between two splints and rolls of bandages from his hip to sole. Aside from the light, the open hatch also uncovered an old man wearing a blue jumpsuit and straw hat. Worry etched under the age creases of his features. Ah, shh, Americans, shushed the man as he held a hand over Casper's mouth. The pilot did not speak a look of Afrikaans, or recognize his addled mind, but some gestures crossed language without a translator. He was no captive, he was a refugee under Boer's farmer care, and he was behind enemy lines. My life is in your hands. Why am I helping these guys out and taking these guys out? That makes no sense to me, but... Uh, just to say that we're helping out, this is what we're going to do for now. You look really weird, Adolf. You look kind of weird, I'll be honest. We're doing this just because it's... We want to give the impression that we're really helping out here. That's what we're doing. We're giving the impression. And if I go too fast, we're actually going to... Hmm. Hmm. So after this, I'm not going to engage anymore. Like, after defeating this many guys... It, it, this is a bit extreme. This, this really is a bit extreme. Um, we honestly should, should just be able to go, probably. Just go ahead. Figure out what you need to do. We got enough manpower for now. Yeah, maybe I should not do this. Not very suspicious. Hmm. Because after this, will they really be able to hold? Uh, we just got to hope for the Americans to show up here. Uh, we'll see. This is a lot of divisions. Holy crap. That's a probably really bad idea. So after this, yeah, like, seriously, after this, I'm just going to stop attacking. Abandon to fate. It had been six days since the battalion was sent into the desert. Test to smash the South African positions along the Orange River, which went swimmingly right until the bad word Americans cut them off near Lutzbeg. Now they were stuck between hills alive with a sound of artillery fire on one side and a river lined with burnt fields on the other. A, re a recipe for annihilation. 
In those six days, Vunduk had never seen near Medvac no supply crate. Food had run low, and water had run low, but bullets had run low. And forget the medicine. The makeshift shelter right next to Ant's command tent was wailed and sobbed day and night. Joseph, Caspar, Conrad, crying for the mothers of families, and not so much as a peep from high command. Those worthless, feckless, miserable pieces of crap. How did they let this happen? Are right, you listening, Shake? Answer me, you dude. Because we got greater things than us. We're not going to lose that too badly right now, so. Uh, getting rid of these guys is probably honestly devastating for the war effort. So. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't do this. I mean. Jesus Christ. This is a lot of guys. And the Secret War. And if this doesn't go poorly, then we'll just do whatever we need to do to make sure it goes okay. So. Audacity. Dramatis Possone. Wolfgang Schenk leaning back into the leather chair in his dimly lit off uh, office. The hour was late, he had no, yet he had no desire to leave without the will to carry himself. Away, of course. Following as he uncorked a bottle of whiskey, <clears throat> he pressed the bottle to his lips and down as much toxic liquid as he could. Breaking to cough as his throat burned, Schenk placed the bottle back down onto his desk alongside with other empty bottles. He needed to forget. Why would God not let him forget? Schenk lingered upon the thought as he swallowed yet another swig of whiskey, only to hack out another series of coughs. Who would... What would it take to forget? He ruminated over the atrocities he had signed off over in the course of his career. Decent people, men, women, and even children, unable to skip the fuses of his bombs or the barrels of his troops' rifles. He wondered if it would make any difference if they knew he did not wish for any of it. Shink took another burning sip of his drink, tears now rolling freely down his face. No, he thought to himself, this wasn't his fault. He'd never wished for any of this. None of the horrors in Africa were his volition. They were all orders from Germania. One after another, the orders flooded in, mandating atrocities, ruining lives, killing thousands. Wolfgang Schenk could not live with himself one day further if he continued following orders as he did. He would take the fate of the African continent into his own hands. My dreams aren't as empty as my conscience seems to be. The canal rides, nice. The most insidious killer. In the broken retreat back from Africa, the Germans had abandoned much of their material. The tanks, helicopters, and all kinds of weapons and explosives were littered across the continent in abandoned camps. Among this bounty claimed by Americans was Germany's invisible killer, poison gas. As the men of Tiger Force advanced across the Savannah, they ransacked many such camps, eventually coming to, into possession of a sizable stock of grass grenades, which they carried around with them, itching to find some crowds to use them on. It was a regular patrol to yet an, another uh, two of the half-empty hamlets that dotted the Savannah. The radio was on the fritz again, so as they milled around waiting for new orders. <clears throat> they decided to play a game, see how far they could chuck a gas grenade into the village, village as well. A uh, ruddy, ruddy faced corporal eventually managed to get it at ten paces. As the grenade clattered down to the well, they had heard the pin get ripped out and the hiss of the gas filling the well as a grenade sunk into the water. An older African approached him, yelling and repeating, poison, poison, over and over again. With a sneer, the corporal shoved him into the dirt with his buddies laughing. Their laughter was cut short as more villagers came out of their huts, first curious to see what all the fuss was about, then furious. The elder stood his nose blood and began to shoot at, shout at them. The other villagers were shouting to and closing in. When they stood before the panel of their disciplinary hearing, every man of Tiger Force said they didn't know who had fired the first shot or who had thrown the poison grenade into the village's only source of water. Nevertheless, when the smoke had cleared, the ground was littered with shattered corpses. The few survivors were evacuated from their ancestral lands, and as the days went by, the plants and animals withered and died as the poison spread through the soil. It would be decades before life returned to the land, if it ever did. The coward's weapon, poison. Oh, that hurts us. And if we lose Windhook, that looks good, right? The last sighting. Um, I think I read about this one before, so yeah, please go ahead if you want to read about this, yeah. Cool. Yeah, no wonder what we need. We probably honestly need hard mode. Maybe. This is so sad. Why am I doing it like this? I mean, in any case, if this goes way too well for us... Oh boy, that's not good. Uh, that's why we cut off this stuff now. Thank you. Um, I'll make sure that we'll do okay. And by okay, I mean like... Making sure we get through this focus tree. There we go. At this point, we're just going to do something like this. Just hold the line. We're not going to do anything else. Just hold the line. Because we've already killed off 190,000. Oh yeah, this is that was a bit... Okay, we maybe killed it off a bit too many. Um, yeah, my bad. Yeah. I might just balance it out, though, so that this way they can't do too much. We really gotta get the Americans in, though. And the Yankee connection. The Da Suit of Our Hope. Oh, um, <clears throat> long we've sought a path to absolution. Some have since have come to sadness and regret. Others who acted rashly were dealt our justice. 
We who remain are different, with patience and hope, we have laid in wait for the right moment to bring our dreams to fruition. Our hope is small, we can frill, a tiny butterfly amidst a war-torn landscape, but hope is all our souls have now. With this shank is a promising freedom from misery and grief. We have sworn our very lives to protect such a beautiful reprieve from dull aches, sleepless nights, and the seductive beckons of eternal rest, so we have spent years waiting for fleeting chances. Now that we have encountered one such a chance, one such a chance, hope springs from our fingertips as we grasp it tightly, never letting go. Chivalry. It was a spitfire, a sleek one, as proud and majestic as the day it was made, but a spitfire still went down in one burst, a pilot never got to maneuver. I have lived the Lufafa uh, my whole life, you know. Never a moment in Regensburg, where my eyes were unglued to the Red Baron's exploits of our friends, or the Black Devil's thousand kills in the Eastern Front. Knights of the Reich, they called us in flight school, the skies jousting fields to test our metal against worthy foes. Where we prove ourselves equals of aces passed through luck and skill. Now look at us, and see how far we have fallen. The Reich's gleaming white knights sent on its fringes to wage war on hairless boys riding steeds decades past their prime against savages who think biplanes can stop the greatest fleet of jets assembled in history. Let us not fool ourselves, Kunstler. There is no world Germania has called us in. This is a slot of Germania. Dressed as one, more and more stained of many in the Reich's Adler's loft wing, showing to all Germany that her knights are no different than the savages they could kill. Conversation with Hauptmann, Norse, Neufeld, and Windhoek. Perhaps Americans can redeem us. Perhaps not. Um, this looks... Eh, well, not really too worried about it. You know what? Screw it. We're just going to patrol our land like this. That's all. Do what you must. Do what you must. We're not going to eat them. Because, oh, we've already, we already killed way too many of them. Honestly, we've killed way too many of them already. So, my bad. It just, there's there's not that much conflict. And I want I want conflict. I want to do well here, but... Uh, making dreams reality about the secret war. Far above and beyond the blood-soaked sands of South Africa's battlefields and unsung war simmers. In the cities and fields, cells of freedom fighters strike under night's cover and day's exposure. We're wearing worn, smuggled uniforms and carrying gifts from a benefactor in faraway America. Vengeance is a watchword, a liberation of the world crime, the blood of fascists, a grueling calling card. Ammo catches, airfields, officers, homes, no targets are spared for, with, from wrath long repressed, just, justly deserved. On clear blue skies, the loop of a fly fewer sorties than when they do. They sort of life, or where the graces need to last. Where are the stukas? Cry commandants in the radio rooms filled with static noise and a flash later. Scattered dirt and bomb shrapnel. Trusted to turn in the tide of war, the fearsome knights of the Reich were instead found waiting by the many corpses who lost its battles below. Desperate generals wonder if air support will ever be given rather than a dying wish. In a win of Windhoek Mansion's basement, a German listens to community keys and messages from a hundred men in a hundred places. Angola, the Congo, Mozambique, Langley. All operations are underway, they assure. A little more what? Wet work and misdirection. Some more cracks in the fetid behemoth, and Africa will be free, bleeding and rabid, but free. Shanks slouched, heavy against his chair, dripping sweat from all pores. Despite the weight of a continent bearing upon him, the Rex Commissar of West Africa cracked a grin. Soon a petulant man sighs, Africa will be free, but death from above. His orders were to bomb anything that moved. It was, in quite in the cockpit, ensconced in his insectoid helmet, opaque black plates covering his eyes, and a pro. Uh, Proboscoid hose pumping oxygen into his lungs. The pilot could hear the, only the humming of the engine, the gentle serration of voices on the radio. A crackling voice fed coordinates into his ear, acknowledging he set the wheels of destruction in motion. If he had given it any thought, he would have assumed they were carrying weapons or enemy troops, but he didn't think, or more likely, didn't simply care. It's easy to deal death from a distance, never having to look into the enemy's eyes, hear them cry and scream and beg for mercy. The bomb screamed downward, whistling through the air, but the pilot didn't hear them. Before their impact, there was a moment of peace that seemed to stretch for an eternity, where everything was locked where it was supposed to be. Then the explosions blasted across the savannah, blowing apart the trucks in an eruption of twisted metal. Satisfied with the job well done, the pilot turned back to base. He would never see the villagers running to the shattered remains of the convoy, horrified to see their shipment of vital supplies obliterated. Not a scrap remaining in the road torn apart, their only lifeline to the outside world. He would never see the children starve and the people dying of curable disease, the death and agony of their eventual migration away from the ancestral land, just desperate to survive. The Appalachian metal in the sky, sighted from above the village for a split second, had forever decided their destinies, destroying lives, wiping a whole community from the map, but the man who had pushed the button would know none of this. After dozens of subsequent missions, he would scarcely even remember it. Can bombs heal our souls, set our spirits free? Why are we getting discontent for the war will rise? Is that something for us? Yeah, I killed way too many of them. Holy crap. Yeah, we're going to win way too fast here. Way, way too fast. Um, but I'll see you a couple more, because if need, I'll go back and fix things up. Making dreams reality, though. Oh, uh, no, no, I'm going to do this one first, so we can sabotage the others. The blasted wars jeopardize all of our plans. Now we're forced to cooperate with murders and bloodthirsty criminals. Forced to join another census war. Forced to fly our planes again and drop bombs on children again and butcher precious lives again and again and again and again and... The promise. Remember the promise, yes. Remember the faces that everything we do is for them. Someday, somewhere, some when. Merciful rain shall wash the blood off our hands. Then we will walk under the afternoon sun, our heads held high against his piercing gaze. 
What the war will render unto our souls is immaterial to the opportunities it presents for weakening our potential enemies. We shall direct surgical strikes against enemy positions and production plants in fights. Our, in flights, our air towers will never die to record. This time, our hands won't tremble before they open the bomb bays, of course. Oh, the Americans have arrived. Good. Hopefully, the Americans can actually do well here. Um, we're not going to get engaged anyways, though, but still. Oh, the Americans have... Oh, and they're attacking us, too, huh? Interesting. Hey, we actually have a deficit. Look at that. Nice. Oh, the struggle is going to begin, hopefully. Sishin? Cool. The audacity of hope. <clears throat> and we still have very high German displeasure, but we should... I don't know why it's still there, but the only option... Schenck looked at the complete mass of papers which lay before him. Infrastructure needed repair or improvement. Re projected unemployment numbers under a variety of economic plans. Factory plans in such and such province. Militia strength here. Native unrest there. And many more. His head began throbbing. He could not run away this time. The Angolan plan was the only way out. Because no matter how high he flew, his conscience would still be there. He prayed that if Angola were not to become a great nation, then it would be at least be strong enough to stand against oppressors. Who would no doubt come back if they had the chance. German or otherwise. It meant a nation with water and sanitation. And with jobs and income. It also meant a country that could fight on land and in the air. No doubt the other ex-commissars would be suspicious if he made any moves to execute the plan. Mueller, as distracted as he was, was to be suspicious of him using any materials not used directly for the war effort. Who would take well? It would be worse. Any man kept in reserve would surely enrage him, and the man was already paranoid to begin with. Schenck wondered if a free nation in the midst of this foolish war were even possible. Throughout history, there were many more men capable, more capable, and more intelligent than he, who could not achieve these very dreams, but he had to try. There was no other choice. Angola must be free. Break the fuel lines. Why not? The supply lines of fuel, weapons, and ammo, the shield's front line demand stretch far thousands of kilometers of arduous, uh, sometimes non-existent roads. By disrupting these networks on the right, we can effectively cripple our brothers' war efforts. Shorn of even rations, their soldiers' performance will decline to below combat capable. Masking our acts of sabotage as the enemy raids is trivially easily, and the results will hasten this blo war bloody war's end in return in minimizing civilian tolls. The noise of thunder. It was a dusty morning, the bush veil today. A doom came from the sky. Distant horns sounded forth from the clouds, and it was a den of the seventh seal being broken, and the boars looked skyward and ex exalted, for they were simple folk. Dirt farmers, one and all, knew the signs of judgment day. They waited with goosebump flesh for the loud voices of from heaven to proclaim the world becoming that of the kingdom of God and his Messiah and the salvation of their immortal souls. It was then that the infernal craft came from the sky, and the horns were joined by guitar and drum and a voice of, like wailing, and the farmers cowered at what they now recognized as their destruction. The sky lit up like pits of the abyss, and flames rained down upon them, and smoke filled the air, and ghastly filth poured over the land to wither all it touched. Through it all, the farmers shrieked and cried as their lives were ripped from them. Some sought to comfort loved ones, others begged for the Lord's mercy. Young men ran in futility as their elders kneeled and waited the brutal heat and setting cold of death. In but a few short minutes, life was wiped from the bushveld, and not a one of them remained to see the American commander lean out of his helicopter to taste the air. He breathed deeply the smoke and ash of, its cre of his creation, and he knew it was good as he gazed upon the blasted landscape, devastation undreamt by ev any conqueror of antiquity. The commander looked to the vastness above and said a silent prayer to the same god the boars begged to save them as they burned. The helicopters left back through the smoke, leaving the crater annihilation and its piles of black ash behind them. Ash that had once been men who had hoped and dreamed and loved. Later they were learned into a bit of a mistake. And the village was not the rebel enclave they thought it to be, but by then they had moved on to burn other villages in the lands, and it mattered little to them then was soon forgotten. And behold, a pale horse. Why do we lose it? That's gotta be bugged. That's gotta be bugged, right? I mean, it's not like we need it, but still. A well regulated militia. Him had trained with the Gewehr 41 for weeks, and like every other boy in the Lon von Leutwein company, he was ready and eager to use it. When old you. All Jews radio lines died in a terrorist attack, and the mad kind of plane soared overhead. One of the local officials had railed all young German men into town into a militia. They grabbed every gun they could and, make the, and made the makeshift shrapnel, shrapnel mines from old mining equipment. The Etzatz explosives now laid under the dirt road outside town as a company hid among the dry bush of the flat red Namibian landscape. A colossal bang caught him and every other boy's attention. They cheered as they charged from the positions jubilant at getting a kill. We bagged you in Americana, they thought. And one's own good cheer died when they approached the roadside for the next two. And next to a crater lay the mangled wreck of a truck, an opal truck, and its bloody, gory contents, blood, dust, and metal wafted uh, in the breeze as an SS officer, clothes torn and forehead gushing a stream of blood, stood beside his dead truck and dying men. The crazed man's eyes and his following outbursts would haunt the boy's grave to his grave. What have you done? Oh boy. Yeah, we're not going to attack here, man. All we're going to do, um, oh, I don't like that. Uh, you know what? Let the Americans, let, let the Americans go for now, seriously. Let him go. Let him get back. Uh, you know what? We're going to go over here. 
Don't don't guard it. Don't guard it. Don't guard it. Break the fuel lines, my friends. Though break them, break them, break them, and give them the dead since we're here. Cause why not? Uh, America, can you send a few more divisions? <laughs> we only have six left. Oh my god. Yeah, I, I really made a mistake here. I really did. Um. Oh, did they actually break free? That would have been really good if they did. Uh. No, how about you guys leave? Oh, so bad, so bad. Oh no. I, I, I was too successful. Cut it down even more then. Sabotaging the others and break the fuel lines. You know, I think I'm going to go back and get us to a point where I haven't killed them all, maybe? Hey, the Australians are here, so we'll see what happens, but token troops first. The presence of our troops at the front lines serve no purpose but to draw more blood and prolong the conflict in this dreadful war. Saving resources for our true ambitions entails saying only the bare minimum of our commitments to the South African deserts. Just enough to convince Hutik and Mula of our continued if unwilling commitment to their murderous plans. This way we can keep both their men out of the meat grinder, after all. The common soldier did nothing to deserve a horrible death in this godforsaken land and simultaneously put them to a better use of keeping order home. Taking care of the villages, hunting bandits, training natives, and organizing the institutions necessary for a stable, financially independent Angola. Token troops? It's fine. Still they found us. Oh, right. We're demobilizing. Why are we demobilizing? Huh. All right, cool. We have a ah oh, minus ninety over ninety percent poverty rate. Oh, wrench in the wheel. Across all fronts of the South African War, the two best Africans have garnered a reputation not of bold deeds or noble victories, but rather of seemingly systematic ineffectiveness. The A two best Africa is obliged to deliver has without fail proved utterly useless. Sweet West African aircraft buzz enemy targets harmlessly as airstrikes almost always land off target. Their colonial garrisons delay the movements they promise to conduct, not to mention the questionable accuracy of the reconnaissance reports coming from the patrol craft more often than not. They appear to cry wolf of enemy movements and imminent attacks. The Africa shows other elements digging for hours or days to prepare for contact, yet no such contact arrives. Unbeknownst to the other Reichskommissars, however, is that the Sudwest Africans have been highly effective. Not in combat in the OFN, no, but in disrupting their own allies' activities. Further discreet disruptive measures are well planned as well, like the supplies delayed because of partisan activities, if not mistakenly seized by actual partisans within Ost Africa. Shrink sits comfortably in Windhoek, ready and willing to lose uh, this war of his. A nation state shall be born from his blood, yet. And actually, this one, uh, this image is, uh, wasn't that from 1945? The Americans blew up the swastika on the Reichstag or something like that. It's a very interesting uh, controlled demolition, but we have disrupt communications, support native rebels, as well as botch bombing runs. The Sandy Mountains, to his shame, Obus Lieutenant Pasha had yet to prove himself in the ongoing war. Admittedly, his original trade as a clerk had left him untried in a true campaign, but surely his years of service and study were enough to bring victory to him and his men. Yes, he thought. All he needed was a chance. That chance appeared to him in photographs of the Americana offensive into the Sudwest Africa over joy. He volunteered his regiment to its defense in an instant. Namibia's southern half offered little in terms of valuable cities or supply lines. Nevertheless, they can just be as easily formed battlefields where Pasha's triumph unfolds. Defender of the Namib rang sweet in his ears as his convoy of trucks appeared or approached, off, uh, approached the coast. And what a sight his eyes have laid upon. The ridge he had traveled was, in fact, merely the beginning of mountainous sand dunes a few hundred meters shy of the skeleton coast, yet stretching endlessly into the horizon. As Pasha beheld the vast formation, his inexperienced mind hatched a brilliant plan. Even aerial reconnaissance, he realized, can only capture the, the ridges facing landward. An ambush straddling its seaward side can thus surprise the convoys traveling along the coast. And with the supplies he and his men had on hand, their camouflage ambush can last for days on end. Pasha, you're utter genius. The Obos Lieutenant's excitement sidelined rational thoughts as he issued the order to his subordinates within minutes. Colonial Garrison Regiment 17 rode the sandy coast's slope. Now, surely blanketed by the great range of dunes, they couldn't go as fast on the softer sand, yet Pasha knew that security and surprise that it was offered was all worth all other drawbacks. And his unsuspecting vindication would soon come enough. Well, soon come enough. Soon enough. They'll never know it had been a special day. Today marks the 500th ton of ordnance dropped on perfidious South Africa since the war began. Major Lucas thought such a momentous milestone merited a little bit of fun. Sahib, is it ready? He asked his squadron's chief technician. Right here, sir, the native replied, guarding their special bomb. A toilet with aerodynamic fins stuck on either side, like a pelican with a fish flat for wings, unfortunately. Unfortunately, the toilet shone a clear white under the Namibian warning sun. Good thing we listened to you at least, he hollered over the cockpit, else command would have tanned her hives for planning biological warfare. Sahib... 
left as he pushed the toilet towards the pilot's bomber. Yes, Lucas thought it was just fair and a joke, considering their overall shortage of munitions. Besides, the war was grim enough as it is. The squadron needs some sort of morale boost. What better pick me up than there was a hundred kilo joke over the Karoo? If nothing else, it'll make for an eye raising store for the buxom Fraulein in Germany's bars. As he parsed through the fly checklist one last time, Lucas grinned what he wouldn't do to see some poor South African's face as he ducks for cover from his bomber's little silly payload. Perhaps history books will save a photo. Also, right now, I, I reloaded the save earlier. And they still lost 190,000. Like, we've done the least amount of things here. We've just been st sitting here. Um, actually, with our planes, hold. Yeah, I should stop them earlier before, so stop. Also, we have no manpower just because we we're going to lose manpower by just hanging out. Uh, come over here. Hang out. Have a good time. You know what? Train. Enjoy yourselves. Ah, uh, the curse of the mountains. The day dragged on for Colonial Regiment 17 as the red sun sank beneath the Atlantic. Murmurs abounded that the sea drew near behind them, though others argued that they simply passed another narrow strip of coast. As it turned out, the murmurs were right. Like <clears throat> an encroaching flood, the shoreline had wedged a regiment between its waters and the portion of Dune slope too steep for any truck to climb. What he thought were wind marks in the sand dunes, Obus Lloyd and Pasha realized in growing panic were instead drift lines left by waves. So he considered turning the convoy back, but quashed the thought just as easily. Even he knew it would take nearly a half day's travel to return home or return from where they had left. Sea water will soak his engines in less than an hour. Barring a miracle, Pasha just surrendered a regiment to the sea. How will he ever explain such a defeat to his superiors? Meanwhile, the engines roared beyond their limits while the salty tides crashed against heavy rubber tires. Yet softened sand soon gave way to the friction of weight, and the convoys ground to a halt. Half submerged in seawater, men hurried to offload all supplies they could out of the sinking opals. For all the strength, desperation fuels, however, those heavier than rifles and ammo. Water, rations, medicine slid down the, the sandy slopes and splashed into the sea. From a sinking command car, Pasha gulped as his shattered men clambering up from the deep sand dunes to the summit's firm ground. He joined the scrambling mass of seconds later, so it was that he sat on an op outcrop, half drenched, helpless as a skeleton coast claimed a regiment's worth of equipment for its timeless horde. Not the triumph he had hoped for, but at least no one died yet. So, And also, Hutik is somewhat suspicious of us, so. That's not good. Uh, uh, uh the men? Um. We can personally leave. You know, let's do that one first. Why not? Because we'll probably get them back anyway, so. Because I want to lower this even more so. We don't want we don't want both of them to become very suspicious of us, so. Breaking the fuel lines and then making dreams a reality. The long wait ends with the Reich's impending downfall. We must act with haste to secure our legacies and atonements before the looming chaos dominates our faculties. The people yearn for freedom, and much of their numbers stand ready to seize the reins of a struggle against German oppression. Ours shall discreetly ensure these great men lead their mark. Under cover of shadow, we shall build the foundations for a free Angola, able to find its own path to prosperity and thence to happiness long after we're gone. This dream is a flower we've been jealously guarding behind our minds, prisons, sown by our sins and nurtured by our regret. It won't be long before its blood red petals blossom. It will, or we will all die trying. Absolutely. Um, so, we're cut down some of that. Keep spending some more for now. Um, really, I'm going to do this too. We don't need that. Look how, look how well we've done. Without us doing anything here. It's ridiculous. Um, hey, break the fuel line's nice. Alright, there's he's so suspicious. This is why I, I, I got rid of the manpower by putting him in here first. Just because we need... Uh, I, or at least I don't want to get rid of the manpower, so... There you go. Botch of bombing runs? No, okay. By a lot. Somewhat. Hey, you want the land? Here, take it. Okay, just, just hang out, guys. Just hang out. So we'll get this off again, hopefully, because I want to lower that some more, too. Um, yeah, just gonna hang out. I mean, they literally abandoned Cape Town, which is not good, but still. They're attacking us, and they're doing okay. Maybe-ish. Peace conference is calculated. Oh, Himmler's been victorious. Good job, Himmler. Uh, I mean, I mean, not, not good job, Himmler. Not good job. Go and retreat. And then, lower, laying the groundwork. The Yankee Connection. The meeting has been a success. The CIA's agents have met ours in a secluded location, extending a lucrative offering. In exchange for information regarding our so-called brothers in Central Africa and all Africa, they'll give us all the help we need to prepare for Angola's liberation. Keeping in constant contact with the Yankees may invite unwanted ire to our actions, however, and the right suspicions will only grow with every parcel of information we transmit. By accepting America's help, we risk trapping ourselves atop a frail crystal dome. One misstep will see us in eternal freefall towards failure's bottomless pitch-black maw, but we'll endure and we'll achieve what we have promised so long ago to the graves whose corpses we have filled, their nameless, featureless faces feature prominently in our nightmares. They have not forgotten our adage. We can only hope they will forgive, but there is no guarantee. 
watered down. Private Tom Green was a newly drafted resident of Cleveland, Mississippi. His parents with three younger siblings watched the German Shepherd Bronx for him while he served in South Africa. Specialist Benjamin Flesh was from Chicago and he kept a picture of his newborn daughter Judith on his belt. Easier to see her one last time that way if he ever catches a Nazi bullet dead. Corporal Wally Green had joined the army to get out of Huntington and his father. He still saw the dude most nights hacking his tar-addled lungs out before the beating the crap out of him and his sister. Elombe and Mafuta were friends who had lived in a village near the Lake Teles shores. When the Rex Commissariat's troops raided their home empty, the two found themselves conscripted into a helicopter maintenance team. One day, a German helicopter crashed into the Congolese forest, killing everyone on board. Its missiles would have killed Tom, Benjamin, and Wally during a recon patrol. The helicopter crashed miles away from Central African lines, so they hadn't so haven't hauled the wreck to check what was went wrong, like it's fuel dial. Neither have they caught El Bomba and Mafuta pour water onto barrels of jet fuel back into the airfield. Many more helicopters fell from the sky later that day. This is all we can do for you now. Nice. Without even manpower, we can do this too. Nice. And we're going to do this as well. Um, hurting their organization for two weeks is not great, but it's, it's the least we can do right now. Support native rebe uh, rebels. Actually, how much, how much stability do they actually have here? Ost Africa provides industrial air base or assistance. Oh, they're really bad. That's actually, honestly, like, so for this one, botch bombing runs. Uh, there's one here that, like, lowers their manpower by 50. This one. Botch bombing runs. Honestly, that means nothing. Friendly fire incidents or anything but. Our bombers can hit too close to, uh, to allied positions on the front line. I don't like that one because them losing 50 manpower is absolutely 100% not worth it. It's really not worth it. They, look how much manpower they have. How many bombing runs you have to do to get that one done? So it's, it's not worth doing so. Please don't show me this one, but as the first step in the plan for the advancement of all the S.H.I.E.L.D., Hutig and his men in North Africa have sent numerous caravans of workers and industrial materials across their borders. These workers, all African slaves, held in Hutig's many camps, have been similarly accompanied by the guards, who have been immediately set to set the slaves to work on breaking ground for new local factories. Indeed, it almost seems like the Afrikaans don't even want our workers touching their materials ourselves. Our workers are shooed off when they merely try to aid with the construction. Of course, the secrecy on our own soil is not something we happily tolerate. A letter of protest was sent to Quillamane to ask Hutig to allow our workers to spree construction after all. Every day runs the risk of another factory's bombing or a row being destroyed by American air raids. The response in typical Hutuk fashion is both condescending and quite rude. Hutuk's letter details the superiority of Ost African slaves in comparison to our supposedly lazy laborers, claims that only the Ost African guards understand how to control their workers while maximizing productivity, and even goes as far as to suggest that we begin to model our labor camps off the of Ost African ones, as well as training our guards in a regiment based off the Ost African model. These requests are ridiculous and will be ignored as such, but it seems that there will be no true solution to this problem. They are building factories for us in the end, whether our laborers are working or not. And who are we to stop them if Hutig wants our factories to be built by his slaves and his alone? We can, he can go right ahead, as long as the factories are built. We can put these good to very, very, very good use. Uh, we can send arms and supplies to rebel groups and other orcs come to us to start fires in the backyards, which actually would probably do very, very well, because at minus 42% stability, that's really bad. So the more territory they take, the worse, but technically it's not that bad. Actually, we... You know what? Do you, do you want the territory? I, mean, I, I, I like the factories. Don't get me wrong. I like the factories. Here, you guys can have this. Would you like this? Here. Hey, there you go. Yes, you can gladly have all that resistance, my friends. Oh, I love helping out the war effort. Um, up next, realistically, we could do some other stuff. Organization, I don't want them to do well, so either one. Uh, what else? One by sabotaging critical communications relays, we can severely affect the tactics between Mula and Hutig. Somewhat suspicious, not very suspicious. And Hutig's position gets raised by a lot, so we don't want to do anything else yet. And the Yankee connection, of course, is next. Ah, infrastructure reserve. I mean. I just want to focus on the economy, man. I'll be honest. The economy means more to me than anything else. Yes, win. The never-ending work. After trying to organize some papers, Shank sat down exhausted. More time had passed than progress made. He was tempted to, to get one of his secretaries to handle the work, but it was a secret project after all. He shuddered at the thought of someone finding these papers and snitching to Germany or even worse, someone like Hutig. God knows there were too many Hutig in this world. Even more tempting, however, was a sword in the clouds, but that merely delayed the work that needed to be done. He sighed. What was this all for anyways? A free Angola was so far away. So many m maladies deviled in the country. The poor infrastructure, the unruly fighting men, the complete absence of any proper industry. These all needed to be fixed before Angola could even have a chance of mere freedom, let alone prosperity. Shin closed his eyes and tried to imagine the Angola he wished to leave behind. Hopefully, when all this was said and done, his plane would take off from these dusty airfields for the last time. He would leave behind a place which echoed the best of what was beating in the heart of every person. It would be a place where a simple man could provide an honest living for his family. A place where the 
children could run around in parks with their friends. A place where the wicked man would get justice fair and promptly. Finally, he dreamt that this new uncle would become a place which would bow to no one except for the father time, but only barely. That's enough dreaming for now. Um, Token troops? Yeah, I, 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 we need to keep an eye on this one, just because this does hurt us a little bit. Um, less recruitable population factor is not good. Mobilization speed goes down, which is bad. But I, we got to keep their suspicion low. The presence of our troops at the front line serves no purpose but to draw more blood and prolong this dreadful war. Saving resources for our true ambitions it, uh, entails sending only the bare minimum of our commitments to South Africa's deserts. Just enough to convince Hutik and Mutlu of our continued, if unwilling, commitment to their murderous plans. This way, we can keep both our men out of the meat grinder after all. The common soldiery did nothing to deserve a horrible death in this godforsaken land, and simultaneously put them to better use, keeping the order at home, taking care of the villages, hunting bandits, and training natives, and organizing institutions necessary for a stable, financially independent Angola. I wonder who's going to take over after the next time, but hey, it looks like we're okay. Even if the Americans and Australians died, they're probably still going to send stuff, which is okay with us. The object of torture. Through eyes clouded by tears, the boar gazed up, uh, gazed upon his tormentors. A pair of young men, red hair, oiled back, sleeves rolled up, hard eyes. He braced himself for what he knew was coming. Now that he'd awoken, the torture began anew. One of the men punched him full force in the stomach and the chest over and over again as the others watched, asking questions he didn't know the answers to after a time. The torture went to wash his hands clean while the boar spat blood into the concrete floor. It glistened in the harsh yellow glare of the sodium lights. Next came the pliers. He was determined not to scream, but his resolve broke immediately as a frowning torture ripped out his thumbnail. The questioner continued in his mon monotonous drone, speaking the Afrikaans of one who had not been born to it. Where they were, how many there were, where the supplies were coming from, all the boar could say was that he did not know, but they were not satisfied. After the, his remaining fingernails were lying on the floor in the pools of blood, the torture went to work on his teeth. After a time, the boar awoke. He wondered how much time had passed in the dank, stinking cellar. The torture wheeled a car battery to forward and attached jumper cables to it, then clipped the clamps to his nipples. The boar felt electricity light his brain up like a Christmas tree for a moment. The shock was so strong he didn't even feel the pain, but it came, oh, it came indeed. When he proved once again unable to answer the questions, the torture swapped the clamps to his testicles. Ooh! Eventually, morning came, and the alley in Cape Town, down by the docks, a nondescript door opened. A young man with slick back red hair walked outside the room into dim light sunlight, rolling his shoulders and stretches his neck. Behind him, he awkwardly dragged a garbage bag, the contents sloshing around with every step. He heaved it into an already overflowing dumpster, and shielding his eyes from the morning's bright light, made his way back inside. Soon, they would bring in the next prisoner. This light is not for those men. Oh, oh, oh that's gruesome. But was that a story made by, made by the White House? Because cause the, the U.S. does get that option to... Uh, uh, exaggerate the crimes, the war crimes of the Africa Shield, but I think we'll probably end this episode here after reading one more focus. The Okie Connection, Token Troops. Um, yeah, I've already read that one, but what if we had friends in the Air Force? No, I'm gonna see what happens with Angola. Let's lay the groundwork. A fundamental facet of our plans is in ensuring a self-sufficient economy for free Angola, capable of producing at least the basic goods anyone requires, such as food, clothes, construction equipment. This can be achieved by slowly can reconverting the part of our weapons assembly lines back to their civilian capabilities. Other than that, we must also coordinate the resistance's efforts to fully build a functional government. We shall preempt this by establishing legal groundworks and precedents not only for the central government, but also for the various ministries and decentralized authorities Angola's government will eventually rely on. But, if you enjoyed this episode, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below. Let me know, have you played Suvesa Africa before? It's turning out to be much more interesting and much more in-depth than... I don't know. Or at least going in a different direction than when, than when I played Central Africa as well as Africa, Ost Africa. But thanks for watching, guys. And have a great, great, peaceful rest of your day.